Now we turn to that which is the satisfaction of the Savior. And here is something else that is said. He's identified as a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Now the inference is drawn from this statement that Christ was a very unhappy man while here upon earth. And to fortify this position, a few isolated incidents are quoted where it says that he wept. Well, I want to correct that if I can. You read on here in Isaiah 53. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. You see, it was our sorrow and our grief that he bore. He had no grief or sorrow of his own. He was supremely happy in his mission here upon earth. For it said of him, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. May I say, these pictures that show him long face and very solemn, they misrepresent him. Even on the cross, joyfully, he took our place. And he made that cross an altar on which was offered a satisfactory payment for the penalty of your sins and mine. Willingly he died there, for its father stated, As a sheep before her shearers is dumb, he opened not his mouth. Perhaps you're saying just now to yourself, Preacher, that does not make sense to me. I do not believe that, nor do I care for that sort of religion. I do not want God to make a sacrifice for me. I did not ask him to do it. Well, it is true, my friend, that you did not ask him to do it. But let me ask you a very plain and fair question. I'm sure that you'll agree that man has got this world into a very sad predicament today. The wisdom of man has failed to settle the issues of this life. Now, had you ever thought that perhaps man may be wrong about the next life when he dismisses God's remedy with a snap of his fingers? Vain philosophy! and a false science have not solved the problems of daily living today. Well, they may be wrong about the Bible also. They've been wrong in so many other areas. Now suppose for a moment that God did give his son to die for you, and he did make such a tremendous sacrifice. Grant that the cross is God's remedy for the sin of the world, and that it is the very best that even God can do. Now suppose also that you go on rejecting his proffered and gracious offer of salvation. Do you think that you can reasonably expect God to do anything for you in eternity? If God exhausted his love, his wisdom, and his power in giving Christ to die and patiently has waited for you to turn to him, what else can he do to save you? What do you suppose God can do for you when you reject his son who died for you? He would come again right at this moment and die again if that were needed to save you. It's no light thing, my friend, to turn down God's love gift.